Recently, General George Brown, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, <clears throat> made reference to what he deemed the extraordinary influence of American Jews <clears throat> in American foreign policy. On a few concrete points, General Brown showed himself to be extraordinarily ignorant. But on the more general point, he was quickly defended by Mr. Stephen Isaacs, a national correspondent of the Washington Post uh, and author of the recent book, Jews and American Politics. Mr. Isaacs has written about himself that, but for being Jewish, he would probably be a politician rather than a journalist, having gravitated to elected office and achieved success through school and college. He was raised in the Midwest and worked for a number of years on English papers and journals before going to the Washington Post, which he served most recently as New York bureau chief. Mr. John Cudahy is assistant professor of sociology at Hunter College in New York, and he too has, recent, uh, has written a, <clears throat> a book, An Explosive Revaluation of the Traditional Theses of What Happened When Jewish and Gentile Culture Happened Upon Each Other, <clears throat> a book described by Mr. James Burnham as one of those few books likely to change history. It is called The Ordeal of Civility, Freud, Marx, Levi-Strauss, and the Jewish struggle with modernity. Mr. Scotty is a graduate of Columbia who took his doctorate uh, at Rutgers. He has taught at Columbia and at Vassar and has been senior fellow of the National Endowment for the Humanities. I should like to begin by asking Mr. Isaacs kindly to elaborate wherein General Brown was correct in the remarks he made at Duke University. Well, there is, he said, he implied that the, the, the Jewish lobby was too strong. There is, in fact, a Jewish lobby, and it's alive and well in Washington and other places. <coughs> um, it's perhaps the most effective ethnic lobby ever organized in this country. Um, the, the vote on the $2.2 .2 billion of emergency aid to Israel last December in the House got 364 <coughs> votes. It uh, makes you wonder whether they even need a lobby when they do that well. Uh, why, why do we assume that if 364 votes are, are given, that it is the result of a lobby? Or is it just a cynical age that assumes that you don't get that kind of unanimity on any issue except one in which uh, oil interests or somebody are involved? In? Well, I think it, there is a bit of the cynicism of saying that, that the lobby was involved, but the lobby was involved. The lobby is there because Jews are Jews and they worry, and they make sure there are 364, or let's get one more, 365 votes. Um, it's a very highly organized system, which other groups in the society are now thinking <coughs> of emulating. Uh, Italian Americans, for one, black Americans. Uh, it's a whole communal system that operates very effectively in this city, Washington, um, because they feel it's absolutely necessary. Uh, Twenty-five years ago, at the time of the founding of Israel, there wasn't such a lobby, and it was very, very difficult to get anything done. The administration used to feel, uh, the then administration, felt that, uh, that they couldn't go too far because it would, it would affect our oil interests in the Middle East. They told the people who came down here from the UN, the same people who founded, who got the, UN, the Israel moving in the UN, came to Washington and set up a man named Cy Cannon, who very few people have heard of in this country, who's been the most influ influential <coughs> single lobbyist uh, for an ethnic group um, in, the, in this country for many years. He founded the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. Uh, he knows every senator, every congressman, is welcome in most offices. He's a very soft-spoken uh, educator, and he sells uh, the state of Israel. But aren't, aren't you suggesting, really, uh, by um, using the word lobbying, that uh, precisely those inflections of General Brown that many people found alarming are justified, <coughs> namely that um, it is an ethnic lobby devoted to the best interests of, of Israel, whereas uh, to say that, really, is to, is, is to capitulate to people who suggest, s suggest that their interests are out of harmony or out of phase. You'd, in your book, uh, 
And in a recent article in the Washington Post, you, after all, point out that there is an extraordinary fusion between left-wing and right-wing enthusiasm for Israel. Right. The motivation may be different, but the right-wing thinks of it as an anti-communist salient and defensible on, on those grounds, quite apart from any concern for, for a Jewish homeland. Now, why, <coughs> what, 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 what is it that a lobby uh, uh, does that could be criticized? Are you saying that uh, these I don't, lobbies I don't put use the, the lobby of Israel above those of the United States? I don't, I don't mean lobby in a pejorative sense. Uh, uh -huh. There's nothing wrong with a lobby. It's okay for the oil industry to have a lobby in the United States or for the dairy farmers. Where it becomes, uh, this is a classic anti-Semitism, <coughs> if you will. It becomes different if suddenly it's Jews doing it. Uh, no one screamed when Italians put heavy pressure on our government to get Ita more Italians in the United States many years ago. Oh, yes, it did. <laughs> Congress did. Well, I mean, <laughs> nativism. They refused to pass the law. <laughs> right. But na nativism is an old American thing, but, but people weren't suggesting, suggesting something invidious. Uh, they weren't suggesting dual nationality, which is always the threat that bothers Jews. It bothered them in World War II. It bothered them in the 30s. It bothers them bothered them in the 50s with the <coughs> whole communist uh, witch hunts, with the ex seemingly predominance of Jews in, the, in that movement. Um, it bothered them when, when the Attorney General last year, you remember that wonderful statement when he said he was considering doing away with the list of subversive organizations because Jewish intellectuals, quote, were no longer enamored with the Communist Party. Mm -hmm. um, Jews have sort of an ingrained, you know, this Jewish radar which says, there they go, they're getting us for dual nationality again. Uh, <coughs> American Jews are American Jews, but they have other interests, and uh, they worry when those interests are looked upon as something evil, uh, that the protocols of the elders of Zion, you know, that's, that's haunted the Jew in America more than any other single document. Mr. Isaacs, is the Jewish case then different in any significant respect from the Italo-American or the Irish-American case? Not to my thinking. Not to your thinking. You disagree, Scotty? I don't know. I think there's a kind of uh, gut intimacy which Jews have with Israel, which uh, isn't reflected in the way the Italians feel about you know, how the Italian vote is going to go in a given election, or even how the Irish felt in the days of the trouble in this country about how things were going to go in Ireland. I mean, it was a small nucleus, IRA-type-minded people who were, but the generality of Irish well, including my grandparents, and my parents were enormously uninterested in what was going on in Ireland. I think you find a lot of Jews who are enormously uninterested in what's going on in Israel, and quite I don't a few Jews who disagree I with don't the, think you the state. <laughs> oh yes, oh yes, especially when you get outside of the eastern uh, sort of heavily Jewish areas in the Midwest, and particularly among younger Jews, you find. Uh, total assimilation in a sense, the, the Jew-hating kind of thing operating in some cases, where they feel very strongly that, that, uh, that Israel is an aggressor state, yeah. that, <coughs> that uh, it's a power, it's a, it's a power uh, like the United States is a power, and something to be feared and, and defiled. Even among younger Jews, though, the recent split in Response magazine, you know, published up at Brandeis, there was over this issue. I mean, most of them are quite definitely uh, I mean, they, as I say, have this gut kind of uh, thing. So even the new left, in a way, the Jewish new left, has been split. I won't say right down the middle, because I don't think it's a half-and-half half operation. I think it's, they've been split right down the fifth. It's a kind of four-fifth, one-fifth. I mean, a kind of isolated one-fifth that is still what you would call universalist in your book's terms. And the rest of them have uh, consistently re-particularized, you know, in the last... Uh, three or four or five years. Well, since the 67 war, which, mm -hmm. which changed the American <coughs> Jewish community enormously. In what sense? Well, the Jew up until that time was this impression of a, of a, of a desk-bound, cowering sort of individual who was led off, unprotesting, to a cattle car to be taken to his death. Well, 67 changed all that. Suddenly, the Jew became a very strong person. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was a kid growing up in Louisville, Kentucky, and I was a 230-pound tackle. The people there who had never met a Jew couldn't believe I was really a Jew. How could anybody who was Jewish be that strong, right? It just didn't fit with the image. 
Well, in 67, you saw Jews who were always afraid to be Jews. Suddenly, they were Jewish. It was okay to be Jewish now. You didn't have to be embarrassed to be Jewish in the sense of those younger Jews who had grown up in America and whose parents had been terrified all during the 30s and 40s. Uh, and I mean real terror, uh, afraid that it was just going to sweep this country. You know, Anti-Semitism in this country was at its peak in 1844 for people who blamed America's entry in the World War II on the Jews. 1944. 1944, right. Uh, you, 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 you say 1944 before the discovery of, of the Holocaust, is that, is that no, what you No, the, the Holocaust had been discovered before that. There's, it's quite interesting, in some of the literature you find a, a lot of debate whether, whether anybody knew what was happening, you know, until 1944-45. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was walking in Greenwich Village last year and bought some Life magazines, you know, those wonderful stores. And it was all in Life magazine in 1942, 43, these camps. It was there in, uh, in uh, those huge photographs. Uh, nobody, you know, this was no surprise. The, the, the feeling that we wouldn't have had to undergo that terrible war if it hadn't been for those Jews was very, very prevalent in the United States. And, and the Gallup poll, which has measured anti-Semitism as best they can, they don't do a very good job of it, every year for, for 30, 40 years, uh, kept finding that, that the majority, <coughs> in, that, in that particular year, a majority of people felt that the things that had befallen the Jews were the fault of the Jews. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, uh, I acknowledge what you say without agreeing with it, because I don't, um, I haven't seen, uh, I haven't seen many references at least, at least not outside the literature of sort of formal anti-Semitism that uh, make any such statement. Have, uh, have you, you, you're, you're an expert in... Well, what are you thinking? Like Lindbergh's famous Des Moines speech that you refer to in yeah, your but, but, book? But the so Des Moines so speech of Lindbergh did not say that it was the fall of the Jews. He said, oh. I can perfectly well understand why the Jews should mobilize yes. to get this country to fight Hitler. Uh, no, no, you, you, I, I'm, I must have stated what I, I meant wrong. Gallup asked this question. Uh, it's like the questions right now. The Jewish organizations, by the way, poll constantly on the Arab-Israel question. Who is at fault? The latest figures I saw were 44% felt that the Arabs were at fault. 7% of the, the Jewish organizations you know, cheer when they see these results because they've hardly changed at all. You but this is a question that Gallup uh, yeah. asked in 1944. Well, now, when you say, when you say that um, uh, the Israel lobby is the most powerful ethnic uh, lobby, once again, Aren't you, uh, aren't you playing into the, into the hands of those who, uh, in discussing <coughs> Judaism, uh, understand themselves to be making a racial rather than a religious distinction? You know, the whole, the whole uh, uh, gentleman's agreement uh, approach to anti-Semitism has been that uh, you're talking about a religion, not uh, a racial thing. And historically and anthropologically, of course, that is correct. But uh, you, you, you nevertheless refer to it as, as ethnicity. Right. I, I don't view not? Jews as, a, as a, a religion or as a race. I, I view us, uh, us as a, a combination of Jewish religion and Jewish and American religion and history as an ethno-religious culture. I am absolutely a-religious, uh, but I am very Jewish. Uh, and the definition I used it for my book, which is which uh, caused a few people trouble, but not too many. I was, was quite surprised. Was I included somebody as Jewish if they themselves considered themselves which Jewish? Which is the, the uh, most widely accepted. Uh, but the big difference. change, Mr. Isaacs, <coughs> is here you are in 1974, openly acknowledging the ethno aspect of Judaism, and uh, you know, in the 30s and 40s and 50s, that was very muted. In other words, the Will Herberg wrote this famous book. Protestant, Catholic, Jew, right. and there are three religions, and uh, each religion is, is sort of a spiritual, creedal kind of thing, and they're both three aspects of uh, America and the American way of life, and uh, in general, ethnicity was muted up till, I'd say, 1967, and then it came through in full force, so it's, it's, it's a new thing in history for the ethnicity of Judaism to be so openly and unashamedly acknowledged on public television, so to speak, isn't it? You're absolutely right. Uh, the, you know, the black revolution had an awful lot to do with it, starting in 64. It just so happened that the war in 67 abetted it. But when, the, when, when Stokely Carmichael <coughs> and some of the other black activist leaders were saying, you know, let's examine our roots, 
And a lot of Americans who were Jewish had never done that. They were always embarrassed about the tribalism, uh, the uncivility. And suddenly they started to examine their roots. A few, and all of a sudden they found theirs were pretty terrific. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you want to play a root game, <laughs> that's the group that can play it. And, and you now have this fantastic thing, what Marty Lipset uh, at Harvard was telling me about uh, during the last uh, war, the October War, uh, I would call it the Yom Kippur War, except somebody says that that is, that is an a, a example of the Jewish lobby having succeeded. That's an ethnocentric designation in itself, right. that war. By calling it the Yom Kippur War. Very interesting. Anyway. Which has been so. But e even the other side refers to it as the Yom Kippur War. No, they it? don't. No. <laughs> you may be sure. Uh, Actually, it was on a Muslim holiday, too, that the war was inaugurated. I did not I believe. realize Yes. That. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the, the, the point being that at, at Harvard, which uh, when I went there, uh, you, you did not act Jewish. Uh, one be, was very civil, uh, one was very proper, one blended into the, into the panel rooms. When I walk into the Harvard Club of New York, I turn... That's why you won all those elections? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's the little. paradox. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> the, this, the, the Hillel organization at Harvard in, in last uh, 73 was just jammed and the synagogues in the Cambridge I didn't know there were synagogues in Cambridge but they were jammed um, it's a phenomenon that's happening you see it at Columbia uh, in New York a lot with all the kids walking around with the yarmulkes on who are no more religious than I am by the way in many cases they just want to be identified as being Jewish they're proud of it all of a sudden and there's no believer like a, a converted one what what do you mean Mr. Mr. Carter here, uh, when you talk about the ordeal of civility. What is, what is, uh, what are you saying there in your book? Uh, it seems to me an appropriate moment to bring it up. Uh, yeah. Mr. Isaacs having taken the conversation in this direction. Thank you for taking it in no this problem. direction. <laughs> <laughs> um, Talk about civility. Civility. Uh, it's involved with what people like Robert Merton at Columbia have studied as a kind of role pluralism. Uh, people come from Europe and they have these identities, these nested tribal sort of identities. And as they begin assimilating and acculturating and so on, they, they get divided up against themselves. And when they go into the voting booth, they're, they're more complex. They, they want to vote as an academic at Columbia or a house owner in Huntington or a member of the Democratic Party or something like that. So they're cross-pressured by the role pluralism of Western industrial democratic culture. And this solid ethnic core begins to, to suffer. Uh, uh, it begins to break up, in a way. And this role pluralism <coughs> is what civilizes people, in a way, and makes them leave their tribes and they weep and wail as they're dragged into the 20th century. That's well, what the why, why, why is it necessarily a pro product uh, or an earmark of civilization to have that kind of uh, uh, atomistic uh, 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 experience? Why, why is it assumed that uh, by a process of acculturation, you go from a worse state to a better state? I think it is better. What you do, well, you do is you... Be, you think it happens to be better in respect of what happened to Jews when they met the urban world and left the ghetto, or do you think simply it is better, period, that anything that's pluralistic is an improvement? Not per se. Let, let me say this. This process, this civilizational process, of which civility is the behavioral aspect, it's a process of internalizing differences. In other words, instead of we, you, differences, the differences become an inner dialogue with the self. Uh, Yeats has this wonderful phrase that out of our quarrel with others, we make rhetoric. And out of our quarrel with ourselves, we make poetry. It's the transposition of external conflict into inner conflict. So you leave your fists and your physical being, in a way, for what Valerie called 
interior civilization. And, and you deepen, you complexify, you're, you're, you develop an interior life, which is one of the things the West is dedicated to, to multiplying the number of voices that each person carries around in themselves. Well, that every ethnic <coughs> group has well, to go through this ordeal. And, and uh, the, the Jewish experience with that ordeal result, resulted or has resulted in what, in your judgment? They become, like the rest of us, more civilized as this goes on. We've all gone through it. The Irish have gone through it. The Italians are going through it. And it's an ordeal. I mean, it's the ordeal you sit through when you were at the UN, in a way, and hearing all this plural world and just all this multiplicity and all this difference, all this hypocrisy, and you have to sit through it, in a way. And live with it and not react physically and strike out. That's an ordeal. It's very interesting. I, uh, I spent some time with the Hasidim in Williamsburg and did some work on them. And, uh, after a while, I kept wondering how they looked at me. So finally, I asked a young rabbi. They looked that way at you. <laughs> no, they didn't. I asked this young rabbi, uh, you know, what, sh what do you feel about me? And these are the uncivilized Jews, as it were, the ones who are a throwback to the shtetl in the Carpathian Mountains. They've hardly changed at all. Some of them still don't speak English. And uh, they said, we feel very sorry for you. You're one of us, but you have been deprived. Mm -hmm. uh, I had never thought of myself as being deprived before. And they said, but there's no way for you to get what we have had since birth, this solidly Jewish shtetl upbringing. And we are very, very sorry for you, but we want to help you as much as we can. <coughs> um, but to call my life richer than theirs is a value judgment. Is a value judgment. And that I acknowledge it I openly. I have trouble with. Yes, I am not a cultural relativist. Mm. Well then, uh, well then, don't you have to retreat from your uh, f from your position that it is a civilizing experience necessarily to be cosmopolitan? Uh, to, to be well, not to if it's it's totally resisted. No. Well, let's, let's get back to the concrete question whether the Jewish experience in American politics uh, is distinctive, which you say it is, and which I take it you agree. We need to ask ourselves uh, somewhere along the line why the Jewish um, uh, addiction, if that's the right word, that's a good word, to uh, liberal politics. I learned from your book the, the actual figures. For instance, reaching back to 1916, we had all something very near to parity. 45% of American Jews voted Republican. But then from then on, it was really downhill. In 1920, the, the Eugene Debs got 38% of the Jewish vote. Hoover got 28% uh, in the same uh, uh, election. I mean, in, in the uh, 1928 election. Smith was the watershed Smith there. was the watershed. Well, Smith got 72%. Right. That's People always right. think that Roosevelt made the incursion. No. It was not. Smith it was did. Elsewhere. It was actually Smith, yeah. But then, it w then Landon got 15%. Wilkie got 10%. Dewey got 10%. Twice he got 10%. Wallace got 15%. Uh, Ike improved with 36%. Did better than Nixon. And then did a little better in 56 with 40 percent. A little disillusionment with Adlai Stevenson seems to be apparent there. 1960, Nixon went to 18 percent. 1964, Goldwater, 10 percent. 1968, Nixon, 17 percent. And this last time around, Nixon, 35 percent, doubled between 1968 and 1970. With a lot of non-voters. With a lot of non-voters, right. yeah. Except Jews Except still Jews voted always far voted. more heavily right. than anybody. Yeah. Yeah. They, a lot of them stayed yeah. home in, in 72. They just couldn't, you know, like the contributors who sat on their wallets, a lot of Jewish voters who normally would have voted didn't, and it hurt them. Yeah. Uh, it was an, an internalized pain, I must but, say. But he, 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 now, he now is a graph <laughs> uh, which is clearly not dominated by Israel. And um, I, think it, um, I think it's significant to point out that... Um, uh, no effort to make Israel uh, uh, the source of an anti-Semitic movement in America, so far as I can see, has met with any success. 
Now, that may be because of that uh, odd conjunction of pressures that you speak of. Americans who like the idea of an anti-communist salient at that end of the Mediterranean fusing with Jews who want to protect Israel but are otherwise uh, indifferent to America's defense posture so that there is a common front, 70 percent, as you say. And fusing but with the number of Americans with an ancestral feeling about the Holy Land, too, which is very important in the pro-Israel. Pro well, I, I don't know that there was a lot of resentment against the Arabs when they controlled most of the Holy Land, which is no, up, up until 1967. But it wasn't polarized then. It wasn't really known as a Holy Land issue in those days. Well, perhaps we should introduce that also as an element. Still, uh, it, it, this, these figures would appear to make plain that, uh, that the, the, the American Jew in politics, using the exact title of your book, has, has tended to identify with the Democratic Party, with the, with the left party. That's correct. And the Republican Party, by the way, w when, before they switched, was the left party. Yes. Yeah, sure. Now, that, um, uh, there are several explanations for that. Mr. Bookbinder, for instance, takes the position that uh, the Jews have been driven primarily by fear, having suffered so much, and that they have viewed the left party as the party which most significantly protects them from whatever is the inchoate uh, threat of the period. Uh, obviously, uh, Nazism in the 30s, early 30s, uh, and uh, uh, nowadays, presumably, a return to anti-Semitism. You make the point somewhere in your book that uh, uh, anti-Semitism anti, anti is considered to be a, almost a necessary property of the right wing. It is a part of the right gestalt. Yeah. In fact, Ernest yeah. Vandenhag says if the right wing isn't anti-Semitic, yeah, it yeah. ought to be. It ought to be, yeah, yeah. yeah. So something wrong somewhere. I, I, I viewed through Jewish eyes. Now, yes, is, is this is, is this uh, uh, is this what I consider to be lunacy? Uh, correctly identified, or is it simply uh, a, a lazy subscription to a series of myths? It's a rationalization. Which rationalization? Yes. It's, it's the, the Jewish affiliation with the Democratic Party is very, very complex. I mean, people have always said Jews are liberal voters and they vote against their self-interest. And that doesn't wash. That's how I came up with my thesis that Jews aren't liberal voters. They are the most, self, most self-interested voters in the society. The Democratic Party was open to the Jews. In terms of economics, it needed the Jews. It was a social, psychological thing. It was the club. You, 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 all of your affiliations, from the country club to the congregation, if you were still a worshiping Jew, were those of fellow Democrats. It became a system. And right. open to what you call in your book entrepreneurial fundraising, right. whereas the Republican Party is rather closed out it's to that kind of fundraising. The figure, you know, fewer than 8% of Jews are Republicans, which is a quite a startling statistic. And yes, they are afraid of the right. They are, they are aware that, that the Republican Party recently has housed most of the anti-Semites of our world, the Tom Watson type of populist thing. But George McGovern threw a real twist because a lot of Jews saw him, <coughs> if, as, if not anti-Semitic, certainly anti-Jewish. They couldn't figure him. And that's why a lot stayed home and a lot why more voted think, for Nixon. Why did they think McGovern was anti-Jewish? Well, for one... Be because he wanted to debilitate the defense structure and therefore couldn't defend Israel? That, that was one step. I mean, this whole isolation. They weren't didn't sure work. whether he was stupid or anti-Semitic, I think. A Goyesha Cup kind of person. Did they like Like uh, Reckless in the first chapter of your book. I mean, they couldn't figure that guy out in a way. How could he be that stupid in a way? Well, in a sense, but they were, it was all sorts of things, like his economic thing, the $1,000 yeah. giveaway. You know, a lot of Jews are in merchants and uh, they're very skilled in economics. Mm -hmm. And they distrust very much a, a presidential candidate who isn't very sharp or appears to be very sharp in matters of economics. Uh, they distrusted his quotas thing, uh, the whole idea of proportional representation. Uh, proportional but representation was the way he used to put it. And that he's being pro-UN itself. It's killed him with reckless, Everything right? was anti-Jewish. The stu Jews still voted for him, two to one. You know, Ninety percent of the white people in this country voted but the funds were cut Nixon. off, though. And 66, 65 percent of the Jews voted for George McGovern. I mean, there's this, still this very lingering, lingering hatred of the Republican Party, and of Richard Nixon in particular. Sort of like the Southern White. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but you, you say it was it is a rationalization that is irrational. Is I, b I believe so. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I uh, I know so many people, politicians, of the right, who are far more humanistic than those politicians of the left. I find uh, like Bill Buckley say. Well, like his brother, uh, your brother, I his found... His sainted brother. You is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, David Broder and I, before I went to New York three and a half years ago, went, and I made a tour of all the New York delegation. And we were so shocked because the liberals were always ab abrasive, uh, in a sense anti-humanistic, and the conservatives were always uh, more humanistic. Uh, and we, we talked about it uh, with your brother as we came out of his office. David Jones was there and, and participating. Dave was one of the founding leaders, I guess, of the Young Americans for Freedom. But there is this, this Jewish paranoia of the right. Uh, London Hong's comment is, is right to the point. Uh, if, it's, if it's not, it should be. Um, Who would you go to a work. desert island with, Edmund Burke or the head of the ADL? <laughs> Uh, I can't answer that question because the head <laughs> of the ADL is a friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> Edmund oh. Burke. <laughs> well, ADA, is, excuse is, me, ADA. Is, 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 it, is, is, it, um, is it your point that, um, that a mechanistic liberalism has taken over? The, well, what, 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 Van, what uh, Sidney Hook calls ritualistic liberalism. Absolutely. Which, which has lost sight of the human values. But they're, they're voting this self-interest line, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and it varies from election to election. Um, presidential vote is one thing. Uh, when Jews voted against in, in Philadelphia, you commented on a piece in your magazine some years ago that, that it was very noticeable when the Jews of Philadelphia voted against a classic liberal, young Billy Green, for Frank Rizzo in the primary, mayoralty primary. It was a very fascinating vote, and people who were sharp picked it up then. It happened in New York on the Police Review Board issue. They were voting self-interest. Right. On presidential politics, the vote changes. They tend to vote more ritualistically on a presidential plane than on the local, congressional, mayoral, con uh, any other kind of race. Mm -hmm. And you can't uh, go into a congressional district and assume the Jews are going to be, quote, liberal. And as I, I, I hope I made very clear in my book, that in Europe, before the Jews and everybody else were enfranchised, they were the most conservative of all the people. They were the best <coughs> off economically. <coughs> They were, bartering with they were bartering with kings, they were bartering with popes and bishops, and they were doing okay compared with everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. And they were not liberal, and they, the San Simeonism was, as you, uh, his book is coming into the edge of that, which is anti-Semitic to its core. Yeah. Can I bring up a quarrel with your book at this point? Please. In the end, uh, you have a chapter on Jews and blacks, and you say the, the move to the right in the late 60s and 70s by the Jewish community. You said that really isn't so un-Jewish as it seems, because Judaism is a very conservative religion. You remember that passage? Right. Fine, I, I agree with you. I think it is. And then you mention this 1848 thing. But in the early part of the book, you speak about their involvement in law and progressive law and you say, Jew, the Jewish attitude to law is law is an instrument of human improvement. The, the law is made for man, you say, almost echoing Jesus, you know, who said the Sabbath is made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Right. You say the, the Jewish attitude, the, the law is made for man. This is the European attitude of the rabbis and so on. Uh, that is just bad history. I mean, the, uh, the, the Jewish halakha was the most rigid kind of legal system in history in a way. So I, I totally the, the, Jewish, the, the Jewish entry into law and the flowering in, in Brandeis and Cardoso and so on, which is a wonderful thing, has roots, are very complicated, but they're not in this use of human law as an ins a progressive instrument of human betterment and so on. That, that is just crazy. You read the, the Jewish history differently than I do. I sure do. The, <laughs> the rabbis who wielded the, the Talmudic law were absolutely adaptable. They Went man. around a few corners, but the that attitude the very to the law, you, uh, you say, was not an end in itself. It was. The law was given by Moses. They had a holy awe of the law, a reverential attitude to the law, and not this instrumental, pragmatic view of But of as a changing law, law, that's how you lived by that law. It had to change. The whole basis of it Judaism did, is that it's a changing law. Historically and de facto, it did change, and it did adapt. But you're talking of norms. 
It's, it's as though this was the normative view, the normative Jewish view of law, was this wonderfully humanitarian, adaptable sort of thing. And that's why you had this great flowering of Jews into law and lawyers and, and uh, members of the Supreme Court and so no, on. No, I the don't beginning of the book, This is where Judaism is progressive, you might say, whereas at the end of the book, as they become conservative in the 60s and so on, you say, well, Judaism is really very conservative. There is a, as a dichotomy, as in all things Jewish. However, I, the point that the, the reason why Jews are, 20% of the lawyers in the United States, by the way, are Jews, which I find just a fascinating statistic, 3% uh, of the population, that these are the Talmudic scholars of old. And like the Talmudic scholars of old, they are always reinterpreting so that this individual's life can be made better. We That's what I call that a theologization mm. well, of history. No, but, but, it, but, but it's, it's, not, it, it's not inconsistent, really, with your analysis, because uh, I think it's significant that you say reinterpreting, which suggests the law's constancy and uh, the adaptation of it to the current challenge rather than, uh, than the, the positive law, which simply alters it mm -hmm. uh, as it becomes uh, necessary. And I think it probably is true, if uh, Mr. Cuddy is correct, <coughs> that uh, uh, a, 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 a traditional Jewish reverence for the law would find an expression in a preference for a, const in a, preference for a Supreme Court uh, decision that altered the traditional meaning of a particular uh, phrase in the Constitution over against, let's say, a constitutional amendment, wouldn't it? Absolutely. So that uh, the lengths to which the, say, the First Amendment have been driven now that you, you can't recite in, in a school even a prayer that has been approved by rabbis, priests, and, and Protestants which, by and large, is, is, uh, is popular with the Jewish secular community, uh, is one which I think they would rather have seen approached as an elaboration of the First Amendment than as an amendment to it, wouldn't they? Yes. You mm -hmm. don't tinker with the basic document yeah, that's right. when you're that's the right, people of the uh, book. Yeah, that's right, which is Jack Cuddy's point. Um, Mr. Cuddy, <coughs> tell us briefly before we go to the panel uh, <coughs> why you think that uh, in a discussion of, um, in, in, in an attempt to understand the Jew in American politics, it becomes relevant to pause over Freud and Marx. It's hmm. a big question. Give me a second. Obviously, it would be a truncation, but... Um, I'm not sure it is relevant. You're not sure it is relevant? Yes, I can't find an immediate link, in a way, to the Jew in American politics. I mean, in a sense, the, the Jewish-American affiliation with liberal left causes, I guess, could be connected with what I say in my book about Marx. But not really. I say very specific things about Marx and his relationship. Well, if, if, if Marx, if you interpret Marx, <coughs> as I understand you do, as a pseudoscientific, a rejection of the goyim. Am I pronouncing that right? Yes. Then, uh, does that not have, uh, does that not have, uh, or does that not illuminate, in some sense, some of the contemporary uh, uh, issues? If if it is true, you talk, you talk, you're quoting some Jewish scholar. You you you, you talk about Miami versus Moscow, the the, the double ends. Yes, that, that, oh, uh, the, the, the the contempt that the liberal, that the intellectual right. Jew has for the bourgeois right. Jew. It's one of my sub theses in that book that the radical secular Jewish intellectual was ashamed of the ordinary <coughs> middle class bourgeois Jewish community, and that his tropism, you might say, toward Moscow, in quotes, Moscow, was a sort of reaction against the, what he believed to be the vulgar Philistine Jewish relation to Miami. So in one part of my book, I say that the Jewish Philistine's trip to Miami created <coughs> the Jewish intellectual trip to Moscow, which was a world elsewhere. And you see, you see an analog of that in the two Hoffmans in the trial. Judge Hoffman, who was a defender of the establishment, versus Abby Hoffman, who was revolutionary. That's right. And each was ashamed of the other. 
Julius Hoffman was ashamed of Abby for misbehaving. Abby was ashamed of Julius for behaving or for trying to behave. Abby didn't really believe he behaved. And as a matter of fact, he didn't behave. And how would you, how would you, uh, how would you discuss the, the, uh, the pseudo, uh, what you would say, pseudo psychological genesis or ideological uh, uh, authority of Freudianism as an aspect of the same problem? I look on the Freudian 50-minute hour as a construction, in a way, by a late 19th century Viennese Jew of a situation in which Jews can relapse into Yiddishkeit. Can what does that mean? It means they can cease behaving and live a little in the permissive situation of the uh, psychoanalytic hour, where free association dominates. They can say anything they want. They can get the ordeal of the civility of the West off their backs for 50 minutes and relax into the uh, withness, the life is with people, of the East European Jewish shtetl. That's a mouthful. Well, yeah, but it's not incomprehensible. Do you, do you want to comment on that, uh, Mr. Isaacs? Uh, no, I quite agree with his whole point. You, you do. Do you agree? I think it's fascinating. Will you help me sell my book? No, I'd be glad to. <laughs> <laughs> may, I, may I request uh, of the panelists that you be kind enough to alternate your questions to our two guests? We'll begin with Mr. Taylor Branch of Harper's Magazine, Mr. Branch. Fine. I'd like to ask Mr. Isaac about, uh, Steve, about the, um, the Jewish lobby in Congress and an influence on congressional elections and what the source of that is. Uh, do you know whether uh, the vote, uh, the Jewish vote in congressional elections can be, to what extent it can be predicted by the candidates' positions on, say, aid to Israel? Oh, surely, surely. I mean, but will it flip-flop and supersede things like party affiliations and stuff like that so mm -hmm. that all over the country you'll find a certain Republican who happens to be on the stump more will get 90 percent of the vote or something? Um, my point is that Jews vote negatively. Uh, that's the basic thrust of, of Jewish voting in my concept. Well, how did Fulbright, ma how, how, how come he managed to be reelected so often there are very with few an anti-Israel position? <laughs> I mean, because there are very few Jews in Arkansas. It's quite, a, it may yeah. help him quite a bit in Arkansas to be anti-Jewish. In fact, it did. Mm -hmm. um, Anti-Israel. Can you give an example of a Republican let me tell you who about made a, it in a predominantly Jewish yeah, district? Yeah, let me tell you about a, an interesting flip, which happened in Pennsylvania this time. Uh, six years ago, here was the classic liberal, Clark, Joe Clark, running against a Republican conservative congressman from the Philadelphia suburbs, and the Jews of Pennsylvania voted, of course, for Joe Clark. Mm -hmm. Joe Clark lost. Um, it was a <laughs> conservative time in Pennsylvania. Joe Clark lost. And the man who came in worked the Pennsylvania Jewish vote like uh, nobody has ever worked. Are we afraid to mention his name? No, I'm going to bring it in <laughs> a minute. He had a, a staff assistant who was Jewish named Dick Siegel who got him on the Jackson Amendment first, on every resolution you can name first. And Richard Schweiker, this time, was running as an incumbent senator who was good on Jewish things, right? Mm -hmm. He was running against a, quote, liberal Democrat from Pittsburgh named Pete Flaherty. Mm -hmm. This time, the Jews of Pennsylvania saw not Schweiker as the enemy, but Flaherty as the enemy. There was a 31-point turnaround. Is that right? And it got, it got Schweiker elected. So that what you're saying really is that the power in the congressional elections is really the power of a bullet vote. I mean, in a, <coughs> to a certain degree. Well, that's not a is bullet there, vote. Is there enough people? Yeah, yeah, in the in the district. It's always played in terms of Republicans and cutting down the the, the Democratic majority. In this particular case, uh, Schweiker got a majority. The Republican got a majority of, of the votes of Jews, uh, as Javits usually does. Mm -hmm. uh, he's Jewish, so it's not quite comparable. Yeah, right. right. Um, but the. There are lots of issues that, that, you know, it's not just the issue of Israel. And, uh, and American Jews sort of classically resist this whole idea that they vote on Jewish issues. But they do vote on the issue that strikes their Jewish radar, mm -hmm. which is anything that's a threat, they'll vote against. Richard Nixon, they'll vote against time and time and time again, because they perceive some sort of anti-Semitism there. They just perceive it. Has their radar ever this, this is before they found out that only Jews sure. attend the 
Only Jews attend the kosher shows. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Sorry. I just said, has their radar ever goofed this this Geiger counter? They carry sure. Around? Well, they gave thirty-six percent of the votes to uh, Nixon, act, but actually, and he made Nixon, a big fat Nixon mistake. did not let let down Israel in, in any sense of the word. Not although, at all. Not at all. although he was, was a Stakhanovite about Israel. Well, uh, uh, I heard it said in Harvard only a week ago. Lecturing to the Neiman, Neiman fellows there that uh, it is accepted in the Jewish community that Nixon in fact let them down. <laughs> I was very surprised by this. Seymour Siegel of J Jewish Theological Seminary wouldn't agree with that. Mm -hmm. Well, I was very surprised by this, but what they said was that in fact when Kissinger uh, stopped the Israeli army at that particular moment, uh, he, he, he froze the situation to the military disadvantage uh, of Israel. But they said to themselves, and what would McGovern have done? It's always comparative. It's all very hypothetical. Yeah, it is. And very hypothetical. Uh, Miss Judith Miller is with the Progressive uh, magazine. Miss Miller? May I address a question, sure. Mr. Isaacs? Sure. Uh, Mr. Isaacs, in your book you spoke about the Jewish influence in newspapers, and General Brown, of course, also referred to this. In your view, does your own paper, and does the New York Times, treat Palestinian aggression and Israeli aggression similarly? If the treatment is different, why is it different, and how does Jewish influence manifest itself in this regard? That's a terrific question. Uh, I've got him where it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> when I came down here from New York, I was up in the Senate Press Gallery one day, and I looked down, and there was a press release, a speech, which was given on this Yom Kippur by Jim Aberesk, a senator I didn't know much about. And I read it, and I couldn't believe this thing. Here was this senator talking about the Jewish lobby, the Israel lobby, and he was saying a lot of truths, by the way. Uh, and I had never, ever seen this man quoted in the New York Times, which I've been reading daily for three years. So I called him up. I said, can I come down and see you? And we are now very good friends, by the way. And I went down to see Jim, and he, he talked about the Zionist control, if you will, of the American press, in particular the Times and the Post, which are the two most important political papers. Did you tell us who he is, Mr. Isaac? He's a senator from South Carolina. I know. He's, in, he's, he's the only, Arab, only he? senator of Arab descent. Right. He's a Lebanese. And the Israelis have systematically destroyed the town where his parents came from in Lebanon, just very near the border. Uh, I have a feeling that Jim's point is correct, that there is a certain pro-Israel attitude on the part of the American press in general and in, uh, on the Times and the Post in specific. And I think this comes from the fact that the American population has the same bias. I did some research on newspapers and television and so forth in doing the book, and I kept finding that the prejudices that were current in America creep into the newspapers. Um, when newspapers the other way around. Right. Mm -hmm. that, that newspapers are not leaders at all. Uh, when, a, when a town, when an area is anti-Semitic, you find zero Jews as reporters or editors. Uh, when a new community is anti-black, you find no blacks or no women or whatever the, that particular political atmosphere is, which is why you have so few Jews in, in editorial top positions on newspapers and in ownership. Uh, but you find, since most of these editors, by the way, who are picking the news, who are making the judgments, are not Jewish, it's sort of an American attitude. And it shows on the Times, it shows on the Post, it shows on the, the Wall Street Journal, any paper you want to name because there is an affinity with the Hebrew Christian type of people there instead of the, the Arab, the Koran readers. What role does guilt play in that, would you say, Mr. Isaacs? Enormous, enormous. Gentile guilt Absolutely. about the Holocaust, what, what about, about commercial European fear? history? None. There was the famous episode uh, of um, the alleged anti-Semitism of um, General Patton, which was, uh, it was during the war. And his actions in slapping that soldier were defended by the New York Daily News. And there was then some sort of a commercial boycott of the Daily News uh, by advertisers, which, uh, after two or three months, brought an apology or, or whatever. Is, is that, in your judgment, a. It doesn't <coughs> wash anymore. It doesn't. Uh, at least it, I know I can't speak for the Times, obviously, but I, I can, in this sense, speak for the Post. Uh, I have seen attempts at economic threats against the Washington Post in, in cases in which I've been involved. And if you want to see somebody hard nosed, it's the Washington Post when that is threatened. They'll, mm -hmm. go, they'll lean over backwards to go the other way. Mm -hmm. I remember once Colonel McCormick uh, <coughs> was told that 
by Representative Marshall Field. This was 1952 when he refused to back Eisenhower because his man Taft had been beaten. And he started a new party called the Americanist Party and was urging all of his readers to vote for its candidate, whoever it was. And somebody came to him and he said that the Marshall Field would suspend its advertising unless he backed one of the major candidates, to which his reply was, that's fine, but just tell them they'll never be permitted to advertise again. <laughs> and that turned out to be apparently a sufficient uh, counter-strike <laughs> to, uh, to abort that threat. Mm -hmm. I suppose the New York Times has that kind of power. Oh, sure. But not, not everybody would. Well, the smaller papers, I don't know about the smaller papers, but certainly when you get to the size and the, and the kind of breadth in your advertising. Yeah. That's a wonderful threat, by the way. When, when crank readers call us up and start complaining, I say, if you don't stop, I'm going to cut off your subscription. <laughs> 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 Mr. Frank, uh, Donatelli is executive director of Young Americans for Freedom. Mr. Donatelli? Yes, my question is directed to both individuals. And you touched on this earlier, but perhaps you could comment more fully on the future on uh, as far as how, in your view, the Jewish people will vote in presidential elections first and secondly in local elections. It seems that we have contrary currents flowing here, arguing in favor of democratic liberalism. Of course, you have a strong tradition that you discussed. On the other hand, we also discuss things such as quotas, which the Jewish people are very much opposed to. We see the basic uh, social conservatism of the Jewish people that Mr. Isaac spoke of. But then you throw in the, the example of Mr. Schweiker, a liberal Republican, who received a majority of Jewish votes. So there are many possibilities. In your judgment, which way do you think the Jewish vote will go in the future? I don't think you can predict that. Um, How about it depends. An educated guess? You, you, you just can't do that because it depends very much upon who the who the individuals are and what the you know issues change very very quickly. I once I once asked John Lindsay what his plans were for uh, you know the following year, and uh, he said you must understand that in mature. <laughs> 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 I'm going to stop right there. Hey, that's too good. Uh, and he said, you must understand that in, a, in my life, 24 hours is a year. That politics changes mm -hmm. too fast. Issues change Well, too I, fast. I think it's perfectly easy to predict, isn't it, that um, uh, <coughs> political optimism being what it is, <coughs> if there's another war in the Middle East, and if there is, or, or even if there isn't, if there is a reimposition <coughs> of the uh, Arab uh, embargo, there is going to be, in the dynamics of our situation, almost inevitably, uh, a party that will start to be pro-Israel, uh, I mean, uh, pro-Arab, in the sense of, uh, of uh, desiring, in, in, in the sense of wanting uh, an end to the sacrifice of expensive and scarce gasoline. Now. Uh, it is likelier, I should think, that that would be the Republican Party than the Democratic Party. I'm not sure that In that would In which case, happen. the polarization would continue, wouldn't it? I don't think that that would happen. Uh, you know, the, the American Jewish community has successfully made the, the, uh, the one, two, three switch, which is to be anti-Israel is to be anti-Jewish. Mm -hmm. the, the intellectuals say to be anti-Israel. That's the new mut mutation of the centuries-old anti-Semitism. Um, so the Republican Party, although it could get away with doing that, uh, political anti-Semitism in this country is pretty much frowned upon. It doesn't work, and that is considered anti-Semitism. Well, uh, how long that would endure would be the interesting question. You know, whether, in, uh, whether the local congressman would start saying that, uh, that uh, Israel is being unreasonable and so on and so forth. I think there's a certain amount of that already. Surely there is. Because yeah. there is much more pressure on Israel to reduce its uh, frontiers from the post-67 frontiers than there was, say, a year and a half ago. But it seems to have been applied evenly, doesn't it, among Democrats and Republicans? We could escape the whole problem if the suggestion of certain pundits that Israel be made our 51st state were taken <laughs> seriously. <laughs> yes, I'm surprised that wasn't taken more seriously. It really wasn't, was it? I guess you can't very well have a homeland and be just a mere state. <laughs> 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 You'd have certain troubles with the First Amendment, too. Uh, Mr. Branch. Um, Mr. Cudahy, I'd like to ask another, uh, I guess it's a general question like that. You spoke of interior civilization, uh, which uh, I took it to mean uh, kind of bringing inside a person the kind of strife and conflict that, uh, that uh, in olden times used to prevail. Uh, right. Are you sanguine about uh, this interior civilization proceeding, or do you... Uh, I am. 
in a word. In, in a world of... Uh, despite ups and downs, I think it goes on. In my own life, it's gone on. In the lives of people I know, it goes on. So I am sanguine about it. Mm -hmm. So you don't share the, uh, the uh, I guess, subconscious gloom that you can find over here in this capital that we're in a, entering an era of pestilence and No, I don't. Conflict. Not at all. I'm, I'm optimistic. I take it you don't want to elaborate on your optimism or it might break the spell. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is kind of remorseless in a way. I think it is tied to an infrastructure, a kind of a, a whole set of socio-cultural, socio-economic changes, which I call modernization, which, which itself breeds uh, a social coefficient, a social superstructure, Marx would say which is uh, civility, which is this complex attitude, complex kind of interiorizing struggle in the form of inner conflict, which brings us from tribal into civil relations and substitutes a civil politics for a tribal politics. Yes, I am optimistic. I don't think I'm stupidly optimistic or anything, because it is an ordeal. It's hard for me. I don't know. It must be hard for other people. <laughs> I'm a wild Irishman at bottom. And one doesn't like to be housebroken. And that's what this involves. In what sense have you been housebroken? <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't wet my pants. <laughs> <laughs> so far as we can see. <laughs> 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 That's an example now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Cudahy, and thank you very much, Mr. Isaacs. Ladies and gentlemen of the panel, thank you all very much. Bound transcript of this program send one dollar to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina 29250. That's one dollar to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina 29250. Production funding provided by public television stations, the Ford Foundation, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.